and welcome to this episode of Brilliant Brains and Beautiful Minds. I'm Melanie Burnicle. Today we'll be chatting with an award-winning artist whose work has graced the cover of many magazines. We'll chat about her career path till now, delve into her creative process and share with you conscious mindset that she chooses to live life by. Please welcome the uber-talented Sarah Laidlaw. Well, welcome, Sarah Laidlaw. <laughs> ah, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's very exciting. It sure is. I'm very grateful to have your wonderful creative brain join us today. Saying that, it always sounds like, like, oh my God, no pressure. <laughs> no <None laughs> creative, the big word really, isn't it? Most definitely. I think, um, yeah, I think you'll be our first creative going live on our show. So this is exciting for me because I do love the way your your mind works, having worked for you on teams and things. So it's a fun process to watch. So it'd be nice to sort of hear you explain it to everybody. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> Yay. Well, but before we sort of go into the full creative process, where did you um where did you see yourself when you were young? Did you see yourself as a makeup artist and hairstylist? Absolutely not. No way. <laughs> Look, I know this sounds really bad, but I I was a private school girl. And so the idea of being a hairdresser was like, oh, no. Like, I don't know. It would never have occurred to me. I wanted to be a barrister. What? <laughs> I've missed that part. <laughs> did, did you not know that? It's no. pretty funny. Like, I think it started from my grandfather saying, you should be a barrister because you'd win every case because you don't shut up. You just keep talking. And I was like, oh, that'd be fun. And I think then once I knew more about it, I was like, oh, yeah, that's going to be amazing and I'm going to be a barrister. And I kind of held on to that for a really long time, probably until about grade 11 or 12, and I did work experience in a law firm and I hated it. (laughs) And I went, oh, my God, this is so dry and these people are so painfully conservative and I I don't I don't know I don't know that I was very super self-aware or anything at that age but I did know that that I just went ill and I just thought oh no 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 can't be doing that and I thought okay it needs to be something a bit more creative with a bit more people kind of input that's interesting and so then my mind went to architecture Yeah, I thought architecture would be a great idea. Um, And along the way somewhere, I thought I would love to be a sound engineer. Wow. So I kind of looked into architecture and sound engineering, but I think sound engineering uh, didn't really kind of go down the rabbit hole of that too much. So architecture was my plan. And then at the end of grade 12, uh, doing the big exams, and I was meant to be studying and I was procrastinating like a true creative person. And I started reading the newspaper, which I never read. And I read jobs. I read boats for sale. I read sport. I read like anything that would waste time, honestly, and none of it that I was interested in. And in jobs was hairdressing. And I just, I don't know, my school had done a lot of work experience. They sent us on a lot of work experience and they would do things like they would get the grade 12 girls to give you a job and you had to do your resume and dress appropriately for that job and come and be interviewed by them. And they would tell you whether you got the job or not. So they kind of trained us in interview techniques. They trained us in like, go out, see what it's actually like. So that was how I kind of, my brain really worked from a very young age. So I saw hairdressing and I thought, oh, that'd be hilarious. (laughs) Did not think seriously about it. Like, honestly, that was as far as my brain went. So I went down the rabbit hole because I was procrastinating of, well, if I did work experience in hair salon, I wouldn't go to somewhere shitty that's, you know, advertising in the local news or in the big newspaper. I'd go to one of the best salons in the, in the city. So I grew up in Brisbane. And so I looked in the, um, the yellow pages at the time and I was finding all the best salons. And my mum had always gone to amazing salons when I was a kid. Well, all through. And so I'd go and sit with her while she got her hair done in these incredible big city salons. And I remember seeing my first punk in about grade three in a salon. I was sitting there waiting for mom in the waiting area. And this punk girl walked out with like green spikes in her hair. And I was like, Oh 
wow, she's so cool. And I don't know, I think, and, you know, in grade like 12, I had a boyfriend who was a hair model. So I'd go and sit in salons with him while he got crazy stuff done to his head. So it always had like that, oh, this is really fun. I never considered it as a job. Yep. So I went down the rabbit hole of, hi, I've always really wanted to do this. I've like, you know, interview techniques. <laughs> and the first salon I called, who will remain nameless, said, oh, I'm sorry, we'll have to see what you look like first. <gasps> and I was like, I'm sorry. Even at that age, I was like, that's disgusting. Like that has, that has nothing to do with anything. And to you. It's hideous. So, hideous. And then, you know, the second salon I went to, it was this smaller salon, which was awesome. And he was amazing. But I had my little schoolgirl, you know, resume of dance certificates and, you know, the SO science competition and the Westpac maths competition. And I remember you know, the Westpac maths competition. Remember it? Oh my God. Okay. So I've got a little sideline. Um, they put me in the, in the best maths class to try and influence me to do some work. Cause I was really naughty and, um, well, not naughty. I just didn't do the work to be honest. And, um, we got back this exam and the girl next to me, um, said, burst into tears. And I was like, are you all right? What's wrong? And she went, I only got 96%. And I just started giggling. I just got the giggles. I could not stop laughing. And she went, what did you get? And I went seven. And she went 97%. I went, no, 7%. And I lost it. I was laughing so hard. My teacher was just like looking at me because I was like a bit of the class clown, really. Yeah. Anyway, the next day we got back the Westpac Maths competition, which for those who don't know about it, it was like, I don't know if it's still running. I think it might be, but it was a national um, maths competition that everyone had to do. It was almost like an exam, but it was a competition. And we got back to the West Bank Maths competition the next day and I was in the top 1% of the country. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, sorry. And my teacher was like, I'm going to stab you. <laughs> yeah. So you if you really try and stop oh my God. Us. <laughs> anyway, so look, my my little interview at this salon, he was like, oh my God, at all these like certificates going, you get really bored here. I know you're 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 too smart to be a hairdresser, you can't do it. And and I don't have any any space for you anyway. Come and talk to me next year if you still want to do it. And I was like, oh, okay. And off I went. And then I went for an interview at Tognini's hair workshop. So Benny Tognini, uh one of the best hairdressers on the planet, literally. And he received a, an award called World Master of the Craft where they gave it to 10 hairdressers in the world. And, you know, there was uh, Vidal Sassoon and Anthony Mascalo from Tony and Guy and da, 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 and Benny was one of them. So that happened when I was in about third year. So I didn't know about that when I went to see him. So anyway, went in for my interview in my school uniform. I love it. And... I've always wanted to do this. I've always wanted to be in a creative industry. All of the uh, interview techniques came out <laughs> and they went great. Come and do a week of work experience. And I was like, okay. And I did. And in that week I was assisting Benny making avant-garde wigs out of metal shavings. And my little brain just went, what? This is freaking cool yeah. and you know I ran around the whole week going can you cut my hair off can you cut my hair off can you cut my hair off because of course it was 1990 <laughs> and you know short hair was the thing and so by the end of the week I had short hair I love it and then yeah at the end of the Saturday trading which was the end of the week then he said come in and talk to me on Monday and I was like okay and I just did not even think what that would be about. I, I just didn't care because I was just like, well, la, whatever, doing work experience, don't care. I'm going to be, a, a, you know, an architect. And then I went in and he went, okay, you start now. And I was like, start what? <laughs> and he was like, your apprenticeship. And I was like, uh, no, I'm going to go to uni. And he was like, what are you doing here? And I was like, um, work experience. And he's like, no, you're here because I need an apprentice. And I was like, oh, shit. And he's like, look, it's the beginning of December. We're about to go into the busiest time. You're a hard worker. We need someone. Uni doesn't come out till what, February? So why don't you have a Christmas job? 
why don't you just work over Christmas and make money? And I was like, yeah, hell yeah. And he said, so great. And I went, okay. And so I started working full time. And he said, look, it'd be a three month probation anyway. You know, we'd see if we like you, you see if you like us. So whatever. And I was like, whatever. Anyway, next, the next year uni came out and I got in and I went, what do I do? And I went to one of my seniors, Bill Signaris, and I went, what should I do? And he went, are you having fun here? And I went, yeah. And he went, yeah. defer, go next year. And I went, yeah. And I just never went, <laughs> just never went, you know? And so there was no plan. There was absolutely no desire to do it. There was no, like, I just fell down the rabbit hole and followed my nose. Yeah, lovely. Mm. But it's funny though, I think one thing that you said that you saw him doing the avant-garde wigs out of the metal shavings, I mean, talking about architecture. Exactly. It, and know, it was cantilevered. <laughs> I love it. But that's the thing. And I think, you know, all these different things that people might not associate with a hairdressing career, you were lucky enough to have someone who was pushing the boundaries on a creative level and being recognized for it to guide you. And then that- allowed I had some work experience in a salon that just did normal haircuts and colors. There is no way I would have continued. Yeah. No way. There yeah. would have been nothing about it that like, I don't know, made anything else look less. Yeah. Oh, you know, I'm so glad I didn't become an architect because like, it takes you like what, probably till you're 60 to be able to do anything incredible as an architect, if you ever get there. Mm. Most people will, you know, I would have ended up designing toilet blocks for Westfield and would have just wanted to cut <laughs> that my That would have been hair. very pretty, Sarah. <laughs> oh, you know? And so, whereas with hair and makeup, I get to create something from start to finish in a single day and I have all these really big creative highs constantly, like pew, 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 pew. Whereas with architecture, it's like one every seven years. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's that's my interpretation of it, not that I really know. But looking from the outside, I think, oh, God, it takes such a long time. There's so many rules and there's so many people in the way and there's so many people you have to rely on to do their bit well. At least in, you know, this part of creativity, I get to just control most of it. And yeah. then hope that the model's good and hope that the photographer's great and go, yay! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Um, talking about that creative process, because we're kind of moving into this part of the journey, I'd love to know, um, for you, do you need to tick those boxes daily? Because for me, I know with achieving something, I need to feel like I'm winning or achieving in my own mind regularly to keep me going. So is that something because you get to do that regularly? Is that something the way you would, how would you see yourself on that level? Not daily, but it is a drug. You do really notice it when it's not there. Yeah. You know, so people say to me, you know, oh, what would you rather do? Would you rather do fashion or bridal or film or, you know, whatever, hair and makeup wise. And I'm like a bit of everything. Because yeah. if I had to come up with big ideas for fashion stuff every day, I would be mentally and emotionally exhausted. If I had to support a bride in getting her to that space with all of her own weirdness about how she looks, because everyone has that. If I had to do that every day, I'd be exhausted, but I love doing it. It's the most beautiful thing to do, Yeah, but not every day. And TV commercials, if I had to get up at 4 a.m., and get out in the wind and the bloody rain and carry heavy shit and hike across fields and up mountains every day, I'd actually want to stab myself. So what, a little bit of everything works really well for me. So the creative thing, there'll be days like on a TV commercial where it's not creative. It's like make her look like a housewife and you go, okay. But then I get this big, amazing high on a fashion shoot or a bride or a, someone when you're actually creating this moment. Yeah. So you get the high, you know, but like anything, if you get that high too much, it just, it, it's too much. So how did you, from going from a salon transition into adding makeup to your repertoire and then, you know, pushing that forward into a freelance career? It's funny, a lot of people ask, how can I do what you do? How, how did you do it? What's, what's the formula? And I'm like, oh my God, I had no formula, dude. <laughs> I, like for me, there was this, I don't know if you've seen it, but Tim Minchin did this uh, address to a university 
who were um a few good things i don't think i've seen that one. Oh my god you have to look it up it's so good i can't remember it's an australian university because it's where he went but um it's their leaving kind of speech and he says you know he has all of these like guides like number one number two number three and one of them is you know don't have a huge dream He's like, sure, dreams are great because they kind of send you off in a direction. But if you are too married to that dream, the magic is sometimes in the side road. The magic is sometimes in this shiny thing off to the side, he says, you know. And if you're too focused on this far ahead goal, you miss this magic shiny thing off to the side. And so I didn't really ever, ever have a goal. Like my goal was whatever I do, do it as well as I can. Because my mum really was the kind of person who said, I don't care what you do. If you want to be the rubbish collector, great, but you be the bloody best one. Yeah. Whatever it is you're going to do, you do it incredibly well. If you're going to run a post office, you be the best freaking postmaster. You know, but if you want to do something here or something here or, you know, in realms of what people do, term or or judge to be difficult jobs or challenging jobs or whatever doesn't matter you just be good at it and so that was my goal and it didn't really I just once I kind of started down the hairdressing route I just went let's see what happens I didn't yeah. think too far ahead so I got to the point where I was near the end of my apprenticeship and I was really tired because I worked in a salon that was intense training and if you didn't come in on your day off to do a model, then you weren't committed and da, da, da. And that was all spectacular and brilliant. And I'm so grateful for it, but I was tired. Yep. I was just a bit over it. And I kind of said, I want to work part-time. And they were like, no, nah, we don't have part-time people. And I was like, okay, I'm out. And I really was very interested in fashion styling. And I'd been talking to this fashion photographer and said, I really want to like be a stylist. And she went, oh, well, I was going to get someone up from Sydney to style for me. But if you want to do it, I'll teach you what to do. And I won't pay you till you know what you're doing. And I went, okay. So I worked for her for about six months without getting paid, probably, probably four days a week. And two days a week I was in the salon. So I went to another salon. I got two days a week. It was called Vogue Nationale and it was great. Like a few of the people I'd trained with had gone there and it was just fun. So I still did my two days a week, had a bit of money coming in and just was doing creative fun stuff. So I started being a fashion stylist, but the funny thing was Brisbane was about that big in the fashion industry at that stage. So everyone knew I was a hairdresser, a qualified hairdresser from the best salon in the country so the makeup artists weren't trained hairdressers who I worked with they'd be like oh my god I'm not doing hair in front of you how embarrassing <laughs> you have to do it and I'd be like oh okay and so I would do hair on the shoots and teach them as I was going and I was like no see how you see this and you use that and, and then I'd have to wait for them to do the makeup for me to be able to do anything else so I would just sit there and watch and I'd be like I wasn't interested in being a makeup artist I was interested in being a stylist. And so, but I'd be like, oh, that product did something interesting. Shit. <laughs> How did that work? Why does that work? What happened there? And I thought I was more interested about learning for myself yep. because, you know, I had terrible skin and, you know, I was really tall and skinny and gangly and right through. And so I always was like, mm, what can I do to fix that? <laughs> And so I was trying to learn from them. And so along the way, I learned from, you know, probably about 20 different makeup artists. It really started back in Tognini's because Tracy Tognini was a makeup artist and she'd do all the, all the makeup for our shoots. Yeah. And so on weekends when we'd go and do these incredible hair collection shoots, she'd be doing the makeup and I'd be like, how did that work? What happened? So she was the start of my makeup kind of pinging my brain on it and then while I was styling I learned from all those stylists and I just started going home and I, I was living with two of my closest girlfriends um and I would just play hair and makeup on them and one of them at the time worked at Westpac and I would send her to work at the front 
counter of the bank with these big updos with flowers in them and like winged lighter and oh my god it was just brilliant like people must have thought like she was mental but it we loved it so she'd be in a waist bag uniform with this full floral updo and like massive hot pink lips and <laughs> it really suited her though so it was fine but yeah and then I started like you know, I'd glam up my girlfriends and we'd do little photo shoots on my little snippy snap ticket and I'd have to get the <laughs> film developed. And I had no idea what I was doing, of course. And I play with light and I was only good at natural light because I could see it, physically see it. Like, you know, never used flash or anything because I didn't know what it would do. And yeah, so I just was having fun. Like, honestly, there was no plan. I was having fun. And that's been the whole thing along the way, I think. Yeah. So when you have, your mum was telling you, that you had to be the best at whatever you chose to do. Can we just talk about that for a second? Because I think you've won every award known to man or woman in the hairdressing world and the makeup world. Have you got like a bit of a quick run through of even the last three years? Because I'm sure it goes on and we'll put a list up on the article about what? all the amazing things you've won. But um, tell us a bit of a story about the awards, why you'd enter and, you know, and what you've won. Well, it started at Tognini's. So the hairdressing industry in the upper echelons, like of really high end good salons in the country, everyone competes like, and everyone enters hair expo. And at the time it was hair expo, hair expo was the thing. And there was awards for everything from apprentice of the year, right through to Australian hairdresser of the year, avant-garde hairdresser of the year, colorist of the year and the state hairdressers and, you know, everyone I worked with, you know, was entering them and at an awards night, Benny would win Australian Hairdresser of the Year and Avogad Hairdresser of the Year. And then, you know, someone else would win Queensland Hairdresser of the Year and someone would win Colorist of the Year. And I, I got in the final of Apprentice of the Year. But it really started <laughs> when I'd been hairdressing for six months. So it was like <laughs> I started in December. Yeah, I know, crazy. It, this is what whet my appetite. Um, Benny was like, okay, you have to enter the IHS awards, which was, I can't even remember, Inter International Hairdressing Society, I think it stands for. And they were the little awards that you'd go to in a, in a nightclub. They'd be held in a nightclub and there'd be all of these benches set up and you'd have a mirror and you'd have, and you'd literally do hair on stage. Wow. Competing with people in whatever section you were in and you won this little you know, wouldn't award, but it was what everyone kind of, not everyone did, but what, what most of the high end salons would do. So he went, you have to compete. And I was like, I, uh, I, I don't even know what to do. I don't know how to do anything. And he I'm was going like, back to uni. <laughs> he went, yeah, he went, no, there's an award for first year hairdressers. The first year hairdresser blow dry award. All you have to do is blow dry hair on stage. He said, I'll cut it. I'll teach you how to blow dry it, but you have to blow dry it on stage. I went, oh, okay. And so my job was to find a model. Oh my God. Can I tell you when you're street, street casting for a model, it is, everyone looks ugly, right? You just like, you're like, nah, 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 nah. And it took me forever. It was like the week before the competition and Benny was like, what's going on? you will be entering this award. So I would find a model. And so funny enough, I ended up finding the most stunning girl who has, who immediately became my best friend. And we have been friends for like 29 years now. She's heaven. But I saw her across a crowd. Like literally I was, I was working on the weekends at the markets because of course, apprentice hairdresser made $2 yeah. and three cents. And so I was working at these markets selling jewelry for someone. And I saw her and I was like, Oh, and she had this brown bob and a straw hat. And I was in like black <laughs> with cropped hair and she <laughs> scared the shit out of her when I tapped her on the shoulder. <laughs> I was like, excuse me. Oh my God. I about, I, I need a bottle and you're really beautiful. And she was like, oh, I don't want to cut my hair off. And I was like, okay, come in and talk to me anyway. So she came into the salon and of course, Benny, bonjour mademoiselle. He was like, so charming. And you know, next thing her hair was chopped off. <laughs> <laughs> and she was just stunning. And so I colored it with, you know, like, overseeing from the senior colorist, but I was like, I want it to look like this and I want it to do like that. And so I chose the colors and they were like, yep, but mix it like this. And, and I colored it. And, and so I entered the apprentice 
blow dry, first year apprentice of blow dry, and I entered the colour, but the colour was open, which meant anyone who was hairdressing for 30 years right down to three minutes could enter it. But Benny was like, just enter it. Like, it's just, this is all about experience and putting your work out there and, you know, like it makes you better because you see what other people are doing. You go, oh, oh, I'm behind. Oh, oh, yeah. And so he was back at the salon making an avant-garde wig and couldn't come to the come to the um, competition. But someone else, I can't even remember who was there. Anyway, uh, did my blow dry on stage, was terrified, you know, put her up there and, you know, you had to dress them and hair and makeup and it was the full thing was, you know. Anyway, I won. I came first in my first year blow dry and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. But then I think it was because she was so beautiful and her haircut was pretty beautiful. Benny, you know, of course, but I came first in the open color. So <laughs> I beat all of these senior hairdressers in color, but that meant I got this award. Like, you know, one of those old school like trophies with all of the things and the like, yes. and it's like got columns on it. I won the overall trophy because my overall points meant I won the whole day. <laughs> Such a classic. And so I went back to the salon straight after it and I walked in with these three massive trophies and he just went, oh my God. And I was like, that was really fun. <laughs> so that's what whet my appetite. And then I entered a, a photographic collection for Apprentice of the Year and I didn't get in. I entered the next year when I was in my fourth year and I got into the final didn't win it, but like, you know, it was such a buzz. And it was at the salon, it was always, if you get in the final, you've won because the industry is starting to understand that you're there, like they're getting to know your name and you're putting your work out there and that's, that's a win. And I was like, oh, okay, great. And then that year in my fourth year, I entered, there was this big hair expo competition, which was called uh, apprentice champion of champions. So you had to have won a lot of competitions, like local state ones, like the IHS ones. And you got invited to enter this apprentice award. And it was one of the on stage. You had to do two things. So one was a haircut and one was called open look street scene. And so you could do whatever you wanted. Um, but it was judged on like the hair that you did, which was done on stage in real time. Plus, you know, like the way that you presented your model with makeup and hair, the, the entire look. And I ended up winning that. And so I got to get up on stage at Hair Expo and get this trophy at the same time, you know, in the same awards sort of timing that someone was getting Australian Hairdress of the Year. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then I went, okay, I'm over it. And Betty was like, you are not leaving. And I was like, yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> so that kind of started it. And then I went into the fashion styling and then I did that for four years and got sick of it. Then I went, oh, maybe I'll go back to basics, which was turning up with a hair and makeup kit. Yeah. Because styling is such a torture, honestly. A full like day or week of prepping, one day of shooting and then two days of returning stuff. I was like, I'm doing a week and a half's work for one day's work. Yeah. Like, nah, too hard. I'm over it. I want to go back to easy stuff like turning up with a hair and makeup kit and I can do whatever it is out of that box, right? Yeah. Can I so, just say I've seen your kit? It's not just a box. That's <laughs> <laughs> not anymore it was then. <laughs> That's how the award thing happened. Like essentially it was back then and it wasn't until years later when I moved to Sydney because I wasn't really in the hairdressing industry after that. I was off doing TV commercials. I was doing photo shoots and it just like it, nothing really was, I didn't go to hair expo. I had nothing to do with the hairdressing industry for about 15 years. And then I moved to Sydney and started working in fashion. And at that time it was, I think 2010, 2009 and or eight, something like that. And um, the Hair Expo Awards had a uh, Session Stylist Award. And that was kind of new since I'd noticed. I didn't really know about it before then. And I went, oh, that's what I do. Huh? And just from all of those years of, you just put your work out there and da, da, da. So I entered and 
yeah, I ended up winning it. And I was like, what? <laughs> <That's> hilarious. <laughs> Who knew? And, but the thing is, it was never about winning awards. It was about doing good. Oh, there's this great quote I love. So I'm all about quotes, right? I Always love- quoting stuff to everybody and their dog which probably drives them insane but you know what quotes say it better than you can and this quote says the secret number one do good work number two put it where people can see it yeah yeah simple yeah so yeah the awards thing's interesting um i learned a lot from my beautiful friend ray morris so she was given australian makeup house of the year 100 years ago um, before you had to enter it, when the industry decided, you know, who was winning it, blah, blah, blah. And she's won that uh, three, four, five times, something, a lot. And, you know, that, it was interesting in the beginning because the industry, the fashion industry don't care about awards. The fashion industry could not care less. The hairdressing industry care, fashion industry don't give a shit. And so she had all these awards, but it didn't really mean anything. But then... She brought out a book and when she brought out her book, she had all of this kudos behind her and the average person who might buy it for their mum for Mother's Day or buy it for their daughter to learn how to do makeup or buy it for themselves went, oh my God, you're a big deal. And they, it actually gave people outside the industry a taste of an understanding of what kind of work she did. Like she wasn't working in you know, a shopping centre in Coonabarra brand doing school formals. She was at the top of her field in Australia. But no one would know that unless she had something like that behind her because you can't stand there and go, oh, no, I do really nice stuff. Like, I think it's pretty good. But when you can say, oh, there's this award and this award and this award, people go, "Hmm, I'm going to pay attention. And so I think... Tognini's plus watching, you know, Ray with all of her awards and what it meant when she actually was doing other things that really just kept me going, well, there's something about putting your work out there for other people to judge. Like, I think, tell me if you hate it. Tell me if it's shit. Yeah. Because that's a great learning experience. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'd rather know than people go, me, 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 me. They're not very good at their job. I'd rather put it out there and people go, nah. And I'd be like, oh, I need to get better. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a nice point because you kind of do want to get better. And I even, look, for me, you, we work alone a lot. But then in the last couple of years, I've worked under you for VAMV. And that within itself for me is enough to make you want to keep being better because some things when you're on a shoot and – you're looking at something you just don't see sometimes what other people are seeing. Of course. But it's nice to have another set of eyes on your work, people that you trust and people that you respect. And if something needs to be better, it's actually really nice to be told because I want to be It's also better. not just better. It's different. Yeah. Because, you know, like there are 75 ways to skin a cat. You yeah. know? Like you doing a winged eyeliner I can guarantee if you put 10, I've got got one on today. (laughs) Love it. But I could guarantee if you put 10 high end artists, lined them up and got them all to do wing liner, they would all do it differently. Yep. With different product. Yeah. So there's no, it's not that you're necessarily just getting better, but learning different ways, different techniques, different products, stuff that you're not exposed to because you are working on your own, you know, and Mm. that's the exciting thing for me. It's like, it's not, necessarily holding yourself up against someone and going oh my god they're better than me but more oh i like their technique better than mine yeah how can i yeah and so learning from all those 20 makeup artists back then meant that i had a really wide range of people's you know tools and techniques to choose from and you kind of pick and choose the things that you like or yeah yeah that's yeah it's exciting so can we talk through your creative process? Um, by the sounds of it, there may not be. <laughs> You've always just kind of seen something and made it happen by the sounds of, you know, with the career path. But so if you're given a creative brief and someone comes to you with a concept, can you talk us through your process of how you would work with that team or that person 
And then when you're looking at the model, like how does it get from in here to out here? <laughs> okay, so firstly, I have thousands of reference pictures on my laptop and my phone. Thousands. Like I screenshot anything that I think, even if it's ugly, and I go, oh my God, that's awful. I screenshot it because someday you're going to have to do something on purpose that's horrible. And you'll be like, oh, I need that picture to be able to explain it. So I have a thousand references. Um, firstly, I try never to copy anything. Um, when I was very young, I recreated a shoot and I thought it was just like fantastic. I didn't know it was not okay to copy someone's work. I just was like, oh my God, that's amazing. I'm going to do that. And someone went, I know where you got that from. And I was like, oh, and I was horrified. And that luckily for me, that happened when I was very young. And so like, it didn't matter, you know, but thank God, because now I'm like, nah, nah. Cause you know, if you have a, a photographer or stylist or someone who's going, oh no, I like in this shot, how her arms like that. And you go, no, but her hair's the same. We, we've kind of done the hair. We can't do anything else. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. You got to take that bit from there, that bit from there, that bit from there, that bit from there. But so I collect references. Let's just say there's a brief. I'll go, okay, along those lines, let's say it's whatever futuristic. We go, okay, along those lines, let's collect all the, all of the references that may say futuristic. And then they will have a specific idea and you go, great. But the thing that really changes everything for me is the model. Mm. So there's no point in getting fixated on this idea if it doesn't make the model look beautiful. Yep. So it's all about the, the face. So if they have a reference that has a white blonde girl for this futuristic thing and they've got me someone with mousy brown hair, I'm like, well, it's not going to look the same. So we can't try and do something like that because it's not, no. So I try and have 75 ideas. Yep. So when something doesn't work, you have other things up your sleeve. So start with kind of a general vibe. And what I'll do is I'll take for a thing like that, I'll take everything that may pertain to it. Silver eyeshadow, silver, you know, things that can stick on the face, silver glitter, like golds, metallics, um, high shine things, anything that could be considered futuristic, I'll take all of it. Yep. Even if I think I would never use it. I take hair pieces. I go, what's the model's hair color? I take every hair, hair piece and wig I've got that matches her hair color. And then I take everything that could be a wig on her and change her look so that I've got options to go. I need to build a shape with her hair versus I need to change her. You know, I'll take like bleach and color to change eyebrow color. Cause you go, okay, if I have everything, I'm going to get the best outcome. So yeah. then when I'm in front of the model, often we'll, we'll have a meeting and I'll go, right, this is kind of, you know, the references and this is kind of what I've got. But, and then you look at this, what the stylist has brought. Because that is totally limiting as well. Mm. Because if everything the stylist brought is shiny silver, she's going to look like an idiot with shiny silver all over her head, right? She's going to look like a costume. And yeah. so you go, oh, well, my idea is not going to work now. And if you only had one idea, you're screwed. Yeah. Because then you get weird and defensive and like, no, well, but I want to, you know, nah. So if you have 75 ideas, you can go, ah, oh, okay. So we're going silver in the, yeah. Okay. And then you go all clear shiny and it becomes really modern and minimal. So your idea becomes this big, but in the image, it's perfect. Yeah. But if your idea was this big with all of this metal stuck to her face and shiny chrome and da da da, and the outfit's crazy, like you, you just can't, you know, it's got to be about the balance. So my creative process is have a lot of options of ideas, have a lot of options of, of products and things you can use. And then as it gets closer towards the moment, you start taking things away, discarding ideas, discarding products, discarding things and going, at the end of the day, what's going to make her look really beautiful? You yeah. know, like it might be, we want her to look tough and you go, okay. So she has to have that, that Russian grr eyebrow and strong eyes, you know, and or maybe it's a completely bare eye because she's already got a feline shape and you go, okay, she already looks tough. 
So that's great. So you get her doing that angry eye, you know, like, you know, and that does half your work for you. Yeah. So I think the creative process for me is a lot of collecting and putting things around and just looking at it a lot and going, hmm, you know, so I lay everything out when I'm doing a beauty shoot or something like that, because if I can't see it, I forget about it. And I need to be able to go, oh, that colour, you know what I mean? Or whatever it is. Yeah, I think that's a really nice process. And I think it keeps you on your toes. And I think what you said about people being defensive is because they get so stuck on that one idea that they do become defensive and then they're not open to being able to push themselves into a different part of the moment. And you do see it a lot. But also if your skills aren't up to scratch. So if you don't feel confident doing multiple types of things, like whether it's uh, techniques or using products or ways of working, and then what you're, what you had planned isn't working and you need to do something else. If you can't do it, people get really angry, weird, Mm. you know, like I don't ever want to do that. I want to be able to go, okay, well, that's not working. We'll just take it off. It's only makeup. I always, I often say that to people. It's only makeup. I didn't tattoo them. So I'll just take it off. And they go, really? And I go, yeah. I'm like, but, but, but it took you an hour. And I'm like, took me an hour not five years to build a building that now you don't like. You don't like her eyeliner. Okay, big deal because I can do 700 different other versions of it. And so that's, I think, where the creative freedom comes in, to be able to have a lot of uh, practice and skills up your sleeve. People go, oh, I just wish I could do it like you. And you're like, well, just start doing it. Just don't show anyone. Yeah. Like the, cre- the magic in creativity, I think, is that, personal time when nobody's judging you nobody's watching and you just get to play and then you stand back and go oh that's really ugly (laughs) but you get to change it and you do it like you know for the average person who's not a makeup artist right who would be listening to this you know when you get dressed to go out and you're trying this new eye and you can't get it and you get really pissed off and really frustrated take it all off and you just do what you normally do However, if you tried it when there was no time pressure and you weren't going to be in front of all your peers or all your friends and you just did it at home, bet you you'd nail it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good thing. I think when – I don't think some people take the time to actually be okay at failing certain things or not being the best. And it's like learning a language you don't speak that language fluently the first time someone throws it at you. And so it's the same with a technique. And I really think that that's a smart thing to sort of put out there as advice to have that time, create that time for yourself as a creative or whatever you're doing, if you're a cook, whatever it is, but that's playtime and you're experimenting and you learn more from the failures in that, I think, from personal experience than you do about when you're doing the same thing where you know you're good at it. And there's no point, there's nothing wrong with doing what you're good at, but how else do you evolve? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really, really nice advice for people. Um, And I think that doesn't just work in for makeup artists or hairstylists. I think that generally crosses life. Life, everything, not even if you are a creative person, just with everything. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really nice advice. And I think people, like, especially while we've had this, you know, strangeness going on in the world you've got a little bit of time have a play do something for you be okay at not being the best at it today and know tomorrow you'll have learned something and you'll be able to do it a little bit better okay not to be perfect all the time yes and I think an interesting thing is what was I going to say people kind of saying you know whether they've got the motivation to do something or not so for me the the fascinating thing about the psychology and your own motivations and working out what your currency is so for some people their currency is money so if that thing can earn them money they will do it they will do the same thing 75 times because it earns some money and you go great for some people it's uh peer kudos so getting you know attention from other people in the industry saying you're good 
you know, for yep. some people it's, you know, personal achievement, looking at something and going, going, Oh, I did that. And that feels beautiful. So it might be someone painting like a, uh, a canvas and, you know, 20 of their friends see it, but for them, it's this big, you know, like that's their currency because they feel like they've achieved. So once you can work out what your own currency is and to be honest about it and go, actually, I really need the, the, you know, the approval or I really need the money to mean to, for it to mean anything, or I really need the da, 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 da. So if you can work that out, that's where the motivation comes from because, you know, people who, you know, other artists who've been sitting at home doing nothing while the COVID thing's been happening, some of them might just need a bloody rest. Yeah. Some of them might be emotionally and mentally exhausted, you know, and that's great. But for the ones who say they want to be creative and they want to be doing stuff, but they don't start it, it's like, okay, well, what's your motivation? If your motivation was that it needed to earn you money, of course you're not going to be motivated because it's not going to earn you any money. It's just playtime. But if your motivation is that artist creating a canvas that 20 people are going to see, but it's a moment of creation, then you'll get so much out of it. You know, so I think people beat themselves up for not doing enough or not, um, you know, like pushing themselves. But you'll only push yourself once you know what your what your currency is. Yeah, I think that's true. I think, um, and that changes for people during time and over time. So it's a nice little thing to sort of check in. And sometimes you've got to do the work to shift your motivation. You just can't expect as well, if money was your driver and you wanted your house and that's what was pushing you forward, now you've got your house and you've got that money saved up or you've got whatever it is that made you feel like you needed, that was your main purpose and your drive. But if you want to shift that, that just doesn't shift automatically. You've got to check in and you need to do the work around yeah. shifting your motivation. And that can be confronting, but it's also really rewarding. Yeah, look, I have a lot of young makeup artists and hairdressers say to me, I want to do what you do. I want to be doing photo shoots and have clients who go to red carpet events and want these beautiful hairstyles and makeups. And yeah. like, I want to do that. How can I do it? And I'm like, just start doing it. <laughs> because no one is going to pay you to do something that they can't see that you're capable of. Yeah. You know what your parents always said, no one's going to knock on your door and give you that opportunity. That's it. They're not, you know, you need to like, it's that build it and they will come. You need to actually be able to do it before the opportunity comes. The opportunity yep. doesn't come for you to then learn how to do it. Mm. I think that's something really interesting what you just said they build it and they will come so for me looking at you for me that's your personal brand and what you stand for and talking looking at what you've done to create that that's amazing you've got the awards under your belt you know you push yourself you put yourself out there you grow and I think that your personal brand if people come to you they know and they trust that they will get a great energy on set you're going to come to set with a million ideas you are going to give, you know, you'll be, you're flexible because you'll work with the creative process. And that just, you know, trumps everything. Of course, why would, why would someone want to book somebody else? Because they know that they're going to get everything at top level when they employ you. That's nice. No, but it's true. But you've worked really hard. Like you said, you've been doing 29 years. So you've worked your butt off to create that personal brand. I'm going to throw something at you. Yes. <laughs> Your top three tips on building your personal brand or, you know, what you would describe your personal brand as. So I think all the talk about personal brand, like in the last whatever, five years, 10 years, mm. has been really interesting to me because my brain doesn't work like that, you know. So I think the creative world is divided into two types of people. There's the people who are building a brand on purpose, a personal brand on purpose, and they want to be perceived as A, B, C, D, yep. and that's how they present themselves in the industry. And so that might be someone who's a little bit more entre entrepreneurial, yep. who's a little bit more um, business-minded. I am none of those things. My brain just doesn't care about that. It's really weird. Like, I want to care, but I just don't. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so like with that kind of thing, I think for some people, yes, making a decision on, okay, I want to be perceived as being this kind of professionalism, this kind of, you know, creativity. I want to present myself like this when I walk in the room. I want people to feel like this. That is a concerted decision. But then the other group of people who have a personal brand, but they haven't created it because it's just them. Yeah. And that's where I sit. Yeah. So for me, the mental tension and concentration to create a personal brand, I'm like, oh, I can't be asked. Yeah. So my personal brand is just kind of who I am. Yeah. It's just because that's how I do it and that's who I am and that's how I think. And that's just kind of how it's ended up, you know? And for <laughs> me, that works really well because I, I've always thought, with relationships, with business relationships, with work, you know, if you have to have a level of, and this word sounds quite negative, but pretense, right? If you have to have a level of holding it together, when the life turns to shit, which it inevitably does, everybody's life turns to shit at some point. It might be you, it might be that your family member is sick. It might be that somehow you lose all your money. Like, I mean, people have lost bloody a million dollars in their super through COVID. Yep. So there's things that happen when life turns to shit that are unforeseen, right? You get sick, you die, someone near you needs full-time care and you're the one who's going to do it. So you give up everything or you get sick or you lose all your money. Life turns to shit. At that time, to then also maintain this pretense of a brand that's not really you. Oh my God, I couldn't think of anything worse. Yeah. Because really you still need to be able to maintain what you're doing because life has to go on. Yeah. You know? And so for me, a personal brand is kind of this non-event. You know, it's something I guess people would talk about my personal brand, but it's not something that I consciously think of or yeah, I just don't, yeah, I just don't consider it because I just go, well, this is just me. And, you know, even at my worst, when, you know, I've got a family member dying of cancer or blah, 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 I can still turn up on set and turn up to a job and people don't really notice a difference, even when I'm at my lowest, because it's just me. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I think if you, if you try and create something that's got this layer of marketability on top of it, then yeah. the, the emotional exhaustion that it takes to maintain that is yeah. massive. I think when, for me, looking at people who have built really strong personal brands, it has come from them doing what they excel at rather than something manufactured. And I think when you stick to your core and you choose to learn to get to know yourself, you have good driving force, good motivation, and that helps you. And I think that pushes you into creating a personal brand like you have, where it's not manufactured, it's not marketed, it's not, you know, like, you know, snap, crackle, pop, you know, it's, yeah. it's you. And you're, that gives that nice authenticity to a brand. And that's what people buy into. And I think during COVID as well, people are really well and truly from what I'm talking to people about, they're not buying into the BS. So just quickly talking about when things turn to shit because they well and truly do occasionally. Yes. Would you have any moments that you'd care to share um, of a so-called, you know, what people classify as a failure? And this could be something on set where you've created something, um, you know, or a life, whatever it is for you, but something that people would classify as a failure, but you've actually taken so much success in your mind about how you could achieve something differently or learn from that experience? I guess what some people would call like a failure or a mistake, I don't really see it like that. So I oh. don't remember them. So just say, you know, like being on set and there's been all this talk of this big avant-garde hair shape and this really incredible thing that I've spent an hour and a half, two hours, three hours building. And then they get it on set and go, it's not working. It's too much. Blah, blah, blah. And it might be the light, it might be the outfit, but of course hair and makeup always gets the thing. And you go, oh, well, that's fine because you're part of the team. And it ends up all coming out and she has a slick back ponytail and you think, why did I do that? But at the end of the day, the shot's amazing. Yeah. So you go, 
yeah, you're right. It needed a ponytail, you yeah. know? So I don't see that as a, as a failure or, you know, cause for me, it's not like, I think a failure would be defending it and uh, arguing with the whole creative team about it and getting weird about it and then making them shoot it and it being ugly. That would be a failure, you know, but I don't know. So I, I haven't really had anything really terrible, knock on wood. Yep. I haven't had anything really terrible happen, you know, like no massive dangerous things, no massive embarrassing things. Yeah. Well, well, I don't see them as embarrassing. I kind of go, oh, well, well, you know, yep. that's life. Because uh, honestly, I think I hold everything up to a scale of, I'm so bloody lucky. And on that, I mean massive life level. So I kind of look at what my grandfathers went through in the war and therefore what my life is like. Yeah. I get to choose that I just want to do hair and makeup because it's fun. I don't have to have, you know, a particular job, you know, because I'm a woman or I don't have to have no job because I'm a woman get stuck at home with, you know, making 17 babies that I don't want to have, you know, or like, so on that level, I kind of go, Oh my God, I am so lucky. And number two, like I look at the world now and go right now, the things that are happening to people in all countries, not all countries, all different countries, you know, like government soldiers, like cutting off their family's heads in front of them, you know, like just, you know, being held against their will, blah, 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 blah. all of mm. that horrendous shit that is happening to people right this second. And I'm like sitting in sunny Sydney, having a chat on a podcast to a beautiful woman who's like amazing. I go, nothing's a failure, yeah. you know, again, held up against that. Yeah. I don't know. I always just go, okay, that's I a blip on the radar. I really think there's some beautiful mindset that you have that people could take away with. And I think what you do really naturally is put things into perspective really quite quickly. Remember what you're grateful for. And then, you know, if cha it allows you, when you're confident within yourself like that, it really allows you that freedom of flexibility with your mindset because you can work that energy into something really positive and powerful. And you know, whether that's for you, I think it's just, it happens subconsciously. And I think that's a great gift that you've given yourself, you know, and that you've probably worked on over the years because definitely people can tap into that. And it doesn't mean you don't have a cry every day, you know, or, you know, every now and then, or, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to, can't say, oh, you know what, today I'm just feeling a bit shit. That's okay. But I think everything that we talked about, you know, you value your currency, you know your worth, you have a really great mindset in the fact that you're grateful and then you you make a conscious choice of how you choose to feel about something because you put it out there and you're like, okay, great, how are we going to work this? And I think... The conscious choice is, is the thing, I think. Like it it is automatic for me now to think like that, but I had to train myself into it. So I remember when I was uh, probably about 18, I know I'd left school and I'd started working. I read this self-help book. I couldn't tell you what it was called now, but anyway. Um, but one of the exercises in it was to get a journal and every day, you know, before you went to bed, you had to write in it the most beautiful thing that had happened that day. And the first day I was like, I don't know, nothing. I don't know. I think I saw a butterfly, whatever. And I kind of wrote down, I guess I saw a butterfly. <laughs> but then as I kept doing it, it just made my brain focus on the amazing moments. And I would go, oh my God, I had this client today. And all I would do, I was a junior. So I'd shampoo her hair, but we'd have this really amazing conversation about spirituality. And so I'd write that in my book and I'd remember it. I'd take note of that moment while it was happening and going, oh my God, this is a really good moment. Or I'd walk out of work and there'd be a sunset and I'd go, wow, I'm going to write that in my book. And so it just trained my brain into logging moments, whether it was conversations with people or things that happened along the way, little incidentals, like the light falling across the floor was really pretty 
okay, you know, but it is a thing and it's a big thing. And when your brain starts logging all of those little magic things in the world and then you watch the news, the news doesn't overpower it like it does when you don't notice the magic. Yeah. You know, yeah, like I'm all about reality. And so, yes, I understand what's going on in the world. I'm painfully aware of it. Um, but I also believe that there is an equal or bigger amount of magic in the world. And it is an absolute balance. And yes, if all you focus on is the, the bad news, then you're going to feel like life's shit. But if, and if all you focus on is the good stuff, you're going to miss the like kind of uh, gravity of how lucky we are. And so it's like that balance. And I sit more in the magic side, you know, I choose to sit there and I watch the bad stuff from the magic side and go, I see you. I know what's happening over there and I'm really lucky and I'm staying here. Yeah, I love it. Now, I was going to ask you, do you have a mantra that you go by? But since you love quotes so much, <laughs> do you have, or well, you can feel free to go back to the mantra, but do you have one quote if you had to choose one that sits above all else? With work, I probably do. Life, probably 750 different ones. But with work, there's this Andy Warhol quote and I, th I wrote it down because I, I knew that you were going to ask me this. So I wrote it down because I thought, if I don't get the words right, it's not right. So it says, don't think about making art, just get it done. Let everyone else decide if it's good or bad, uh, whether they love it or hate it. And while they are deciding, make more art. Oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> the it's just so good because... At the end of the day, we are so vulnerable as artists. And when people start going, oh, I hate what they do, they're shit at their job, it kills you. You go, oh, my God, and you start believing it and it overpowers everything else anyone else has ever said to you. Yeah. But if you keep something like that in your mind of you make art and then you put it there and it exists out there in the world and you don't sit there going, what do they think, what do they think, what do they think? You sit here going, okay, now I'm on this. And that has been set free. And like, there's this great book that um, my husband bought for me a couple of years ago. And oh my God, I have recommended it to so many people. And it's called Big Magic. And it's by, um, oh, what's her name? She wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Ah, uh, yes. Um, oh, she was here recently. Oh my God. How yes, do I her. Anyway, we'll go back to that. We'll put it on the screen or something. But um, she talks about, once an idea is out there or your work is out there, you don't, it doesn't belong to you anymore. You've set it free. It's now its own entity. So people's opinion on it should not actually count. Oh. So it's an interesting concept. Like this book, I loved it. It's very, it's not like Eat, Pray, Love at all. It's more about her, the, the nature of creative living is what it's about. Mm -hmm. And so she talks about the nature of ideas and that they're this living entity that kind of run around in the ether and they tap on your head and go, are you going to make me real? Are you the one that's going to bring me into physical form? And so you might have an idea about a movie and you think, Oh my God, that would be the best. And three years later, this movie comes out and you go, that was my idea. And it's like, no, it wasn't your idea. It was an idea and you didn't make it real. So it went and found someone else who could, who had the skills or the interest in actually bringing it to, to pass. And so when an idea taps on your head, it's like the, the thought is that you are bringing this idea from the ether into reality, making it physical, but you think you own it? You think you made it? That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's cute. You know, like the, she interviews this amazing um, poet who was in her 90s called Ruth Stone. And this poet said that, you know, she would be on the farm when she was younger and she would almost hear a poem coming at her across the landscape like a train and she would run like hell back to the house to get there to write it down and sometimes she'd get it and sometimes she'd miss it and it'd go past and she'd go, oh, fuck, I can't remember it. And other times she said she'd catch it by the tail and she would reel it back in and she would write it down and when she looked at it, it would be written last word to first and she would have to turn it around for it to make sense. Wow. And she'd go, that is not me. You know, I'm ordering this book today. 
<laughs> oh my God, I love that. And so, you know, when people kind of take all this kudos for this thing that they've done, like, yes, you performed it beautifully, you created it onto the canvas beautifully, or you styled that hair beautifully, or you wrote that song and you actually physically did the work to get it out there. But I don't know, it's like this weird ego thing of taking, taking it as it's mine. It's kind of like, eh, it's not mm. really. I love, that's a big word too, even though it's a little word, it's a very big word, ego. And I think when you take that and you put it aside, you are so much more free as an artist, as a human being on so many levels. Mm. Food for thought. Oh, it makes such, such a difference to your mental health. God, yes. You know, because the pressure changes. Yeah. You know, it's a pressure of you creating an idea. I'm not creating an idea. I'm just like, I'm just fishing out in the bloody world, out in the, yeah. the you know, ether mm. and seeing what's what's around. And sometimes, you know, if it doesn't come, you go, yep. okay, I'll wait. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Oh my God, this has been amazing. Miss Sarah Laidlaw, thank you. Make sure you head on over to beautybossbusiness.com for any of the links associated with today's episode. I'm Melanie Burnicle, your host for Brilliant Brains and Beautiful Minds. Until next time.